Hey listeners, and welcome to another episode of Blessed Are the Binary Breakers. This is your host, Avery Smith, and today I am interviewing Derek Guy, who is a pretty awesome guy. I met Derek at the same time that I met Willow, whom I interviewed a few weeks ago, which was for the trans workshop that the three of us co-led at my seminary. I haven't really seen Derek in person since that workshop, but I love getting to keep up with him on social media, especially on Facebook, where he posts a lot about his wife and his son. And it's just so clear from his Facebook messages how much he loves them. So it was really cool for me to hear in person more about that love he has for them and his whole family. It also quickly became clear over the course of our conversation how much having community spaces where Derek can feel comforted and welcomed means to Derek. While it's clear that the church he attends in Louisville has been a space where he has found such community, it's also fair that Derek should be allowed to voice his complaints with that community. Every church, even the great ones, have so much work to do when it comes to the full inclusion and affirmation of trans and non-binary people. So I hope that when you hear Derek's concerns and frustrations with his church, that you'll listen with an open heart, especially if you are the leader of a faith community yourself, that you will listen and think about how you can help be the change in your faith community towards making spaces where trans people feel safe and fully welcomed and listened to. But yeah, anyway, we had a great time, and so did my cat. I hope you all like cats as much as Derek and I do, because my cat Narice has some cameo appearances in this recording. And now, without further ado, let's dive into the interview. Is there anything, Derek, that you would like the listeners to know about you right off the bat? I like long walks on the beach. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, I actually really hate the beach. Um... Well, I have been in Louisville for about six, seven years now. Um, I'm originally from Atlanta, Georgia, so the hub of LGBT, African-Americanism. And then I moved to Kentucky for some reason. (laughs) I am a social worker. I work currently at the Center for Women and Families, doing domestic violence, family advocates, specializing and serious mental illness and drug use and awareness and harm reduction. Been there since December. It's a new job for me. I normally work with kids, so it's definitely a change working with adults. I go to Highland Baptist Church. Uh I say that with the weird phrasing I just did because (laughs) I only go to Bible study. I don't go to big church. Mm -hmm. Um, Big church is really awkward. I'm like one of five black people that go there, so it always reminds me of the scene of Get Out. I'm like, oh, all the old white people. This is just lovely. And I've heard, like I've never visited, but I've heard Highland Baptist is really progressive and great, but it's still one of those things where if you're only one of a group, it's... Yeah, and they're they're working on trans things. Um, I was right there in the beginning Mm -hmm. of... Highland becoming trans aware and a lot of uncomfortable conversations were had. So I think that kind of turned me off to being as active in Highland as I could be. Mm -hmm. Um, I started going to Highland because Bojangles, a openly gay man there, invited me and said it was a church that was trying to become more trans progressive. And Mm -hmm. I came along to do my testimony at one of the Trans 101 classes and decided to keep coming. Um, My wife goes there, and she had already been a member there, so I met her not there specifically, but through there. So it was 
It's a good change. They still have work to do. I think Christianity as a whole yeah. still has work to do. Yeah. I don't know any church that's perfect about trans stuff. You know, I, I've i heard of them. They're just not in <laughs> Kentucky. Um, yeah. It's a struggle bus sometimes. I guess I identify as spiritual more than Christian, just okay. kind of knowing there's a higher power, but not entirely sure that Christianity has it right. I know some things out there. I'm just not sure if Christianity is the right interpretation of everything. Sure. Just because I I err on the side of caution when it comes to like the Bible and how it was written and oh, gosh, who yeah. wrote it and all these men giving their interpretation of what happened and yeah. every single interpretation is a little bit different. Yeah. So you're like, the truth is somewhere in there may not be exactly as they described it, but it's somewhere in this weird world of, you know, when you hear two sides of a story, you always say it's somewhere in the middle. Yeah. That's kind of how I feel about the Bible and Christianity and kind of what we've been told. As, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. What we've been told as a society and what I've been raised to focus in on, so... Mm -hmm. So you were raised Christian? Yes. Um, my grandfather is actually a Southern Baptist preacher, oh, and okay. all of my cousins are preachers as well. Um, my dad was the cliche, like, preacher's kid, so he rebelled and just wasn't about church life. So I didn't really get raised in the church as much as, like, Sundays we would go on, like, Easter and things like that yeah. or if I was with my big mama my great-great-grandmother she would take me because my grandfather preached but yeah so I kind of grew up in a roundabout way in the mm -hmm. church so yeah and like what was sort of your feeling around all it growing up were you questioning it the way you are now or did you just kind of go with it I never really paid much attention to oh, it yeah. to be honest Church was more like school for me, so mm -hmm. I went to, like, get through it, not yeah. really to... Yeah. I always think it's funny because when you get to college, you you get more out of what you're learning because you're invested. Um, I kind of take that view on religion. So when I was younger, I wasn't really trying to get much out of it except, like, Bible study classes and I knew we had Easter and there were lots of candy and <laughs> I knew that you know every once in a while we would have Christmas and Christmas was about Jesus I think in a way mm -hmm. um that's really all I got out of it when I was younger so when did you start getting more sort of invested in it or at least sort of thinking more critically I think when I was in college. In college, I joined a co-ed Christian service fraternity called Kappa Chi. Okay. And I remember there were LGBT people in Kappa Chi. Well, more LGB people mm -hmm. in Kappa Chi. And I felt like, oh, okay, so how are we interpreting the Bible now? Because mm -hmm. when I was younger, when I was back in high school, I voluntarily went to conversion camp. So oh, wow. I had already had like I knew I had like an LGB part of me yeah. I didn't even know T existed at that point yeah. so I spent a whole summer trying not to be a lesbian yeah. and praying the gay away as they call it mm -hmm. so when I got to college it was really interesting to see all these openly gay yeah. lesbians and gay men and bisexual individuals and I was like what is yeah. What is this world? Like, wait, you don't have to pray the gay away? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So I definitely had a lot of questions. I started reading a lot more, interpreting things differently. Yeah, it was definitely college when I got to that point. What were sort of your, when you decided to go to the conversion camp, mm -hmm. what were your emotions around that? Like what motivated you? Well, I was a youth leader in my church, First Presbyterian Church in um, Marietta, Georgia. I had a youth leader tell me I couldn't mentor to the younger kids because I identified as bisexual at that point and really urged me to kind of go to this camp and figure it out. Um, so I worked really hard 
to, I told my dad I was just going to a summer camp. So he thought I was just going to a church camp for a week. Mm -hmm. But I worked really hard there to like deal with not being gay and fighting those homosexual tendencies, as they put it. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was really traumatizing. Yeah. Like, to willfully put yourself in that situation. But for me, I did it because I knew that my kids deserved a mentor like me. Yeah. Um, because I am really good with kids and mm-hmm. all the other kids who were mentoring were just doing it to have oh. something on their resumes for college. And I was doing it because I genuinely cared about these kids and I loved them and I wanted them to have a mentor who was truly invested in their life. So if I had to go to conversion camp to do that, then yeah. I'd do that, you know? Wow. So you willingly went, but at the same time it was sort of coerced. Yeah, it was definitely to coerced. to do this thing that you wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's rough. It was, but I think it made me a very strong individual. It made me very critical of how we influence kids. Yeah. Um, I think now that I'm older, I really hold strong to some of my convictions because of what I've gone through. And I think that had I not gone through those experiences, I wouldn't be as strong of a social worker, one, but yeah. also as strong as an advocate because I truly believe that there are a lot of kids who are much like me and go to these churches to find themselves and then get told, you know, hey, your your identity is not valid. Yeah. yeah. And if it's coming from your church, someone like people that you consider really wise and kind and loving, why wouldn't you believe them? Exactly. As a child? So. And you're super impressionable and Teenage years are awful, yeah. so... <laughs> You're full of this, like, <laughs> yeah. self-hate and confusion anyway. Exactly, and I'm a, I'm a, I was such a circa emo kid, so I had, like, <laughs> the swoop and My Chemical Romance and yeah. Life is Meaningless, and so for me, I really found a lot of solace in the Christian world. And I think that's why I worked so hard to go to this camp. And I volunteered to go to this camp just because my youth group was my friends. I I, I identified as a member of First Prez. And as a member, that was my identity for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, ask, was that PCA or PCUSA? Or? I think they're PCUSA. Oh, that makes me so mad. <laughs> yeah, I think that... I mean, this is, God, we're talking circa 2007, yeah. so mm-hmm. I think that was right at the height of PCUSA having all of the debates yeah. about everything LGBT. Mm-hmm. So I think that my church had, my church won, it was like 400 youth, and I was like oh, one wow. so of... it's a big church. Yeah, it's a big church. I was like one of three black people there, too, oh so gosh. like... It's a huge church. It's culturally not really diverse. So I didn't expect them to be entirely open and Mm -hmm. loving and caring about it. But there are some people that I did meet at that church who have continued to walk with me as I've grown and, like, been a single parent and got married and transitioned. I think that I do... I did find some people from that church that have really walked with me through that journey and been really supportive. And, like, I think that that church needed to grow because now they're very affirming. Oh, wow. So I think that, that yeah, like, they've gone through that change. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I was one of the first people that ever had any, like, LGBT concerns. Yeah, and they didn't know what, they are just like, oh, well... You can go to this camp. Yeah, I was like, I heard of this church. I heard of this camp in South Georgia somewhere. Good luck. Yeah. (laughs) We're just going to send you over there and then come back and it's all fixed and we Mm -hmm. don't have to worry about it. Yeah. I think that that's definitely the approach they took. But now they are. churches don't have resources. Mm -hmm. It's kind of what they do. Like, they don't know what else to do. They're like, someone else can solve it for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, like, now that I'm older, I... 
it makes me laugh that some of the kids that I was in youth group with mm -hmm. have slowly but surely come out. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> you were so mean when I came oh, out in high school. Yeah. Oh, that self-hatred thing is a big yeah. thing in our community. I definitely appreciate that I kind of open people's eyes to it a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, my dad always laughs because... I've come out to him like four times at this point, <laughs> but he laughs because he's like, I've spent my entire life trying to get you to fit in and you have mm. spent your entire life purposely trying to stand out. Yeah. Like you just, you were never meant to be a kid that blends into the background. And I was like, nope, <laughs> that's never been me. So here we are. Yeah, that's always a fun talk with parents. Oh yeah having them go on that journey with you and oh my dad has learned so much like mm -hmm. he still struggles when it comes to my name and I think okay. that that's hard for sure. parents of trans kids who transition as adults mm -hmm. um he spent his whole life calling me something else so I think yeah. that he'll get there at some point like he uses the right pronouns I think the name just forever will be a battle with him yeah but outside of that, he's really done a lot of internal work himself, which I appreciate. So, yeah, so you've talked about coming out to your dad. Mm -hmm. Was that in high school or in college? Oh, gosh, which time? Oh, like, right. I came <laughs> out in high school as bi, okay. and my dad was like, okay, cool. Mm. Then I went to college and came out as a lesbian, and he was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> And then I got pregnant, and he was like, I'm so confused. How does that work? Yeah. Um, and then I came out. Coming out as trans was entirely different. Like, I, me and my dad are not super, like, we're close, but we're not super close. So we mm -hmm. are not, we'll talk, like, maybe once or twice a month, if mm -hmm. that. Um, just because we're all, we're living our lives. Like, yeah. but I remember... I distinctly came out on my birthday and I had been calling him for weeks and he hadn't been returning my calls. Mm. So then I just texted him and was like, hey, I'm about to make a status. I'm trans, <laughs> just so you know. And I think now that I look back on it, I kind of yeah. wish I would have had a conversation with him yeah. first. But we just don't converse like that. Mm. We're not emotional. That's how I am with my parents. Yeah. I I like texted my mom once and was like, by the way, I'm queer and you just got to deal with it. Yeah. Like, and my dad was just like, okay, I'm going to process this. Mm -hmm. I found out later, like his ex-girlfriend and him, he processed it really hard for a while. Mm -hmm. And then he was like, you know what? As long as he's healthy and he is safe and he takes care of my grandchild, yeah. whatever, at this point. Yeah. So I think my dad really has been very supportive in the sense of I still get to go home. I yeah. still talk to him. He uses the correct pronouns. He was never going to be the dad that came to Pride with me. <laughs> like, he just, he yeah. wouldn't come to Pride just in general. He does yeah. not like festivals like that. Mm -hmm. But... He will always say, you know, like, that's my kid. I'm never yeah. going to deny who my kid is. Yeah. It's been an interesting transition. My mom, when I came out as a lesbian, my mom took it very hard. Okay. And she was very upset because my sister, my older sister's a lesbian. And she was like, mm. oh, your sister's made you think this is okay. Oh. Um, and, like, she said some really harmful things. And we didn't talk for like a year. Um, and then we finally started talking again around my 20th birthday. It was my 20th birthday. We started talking again in July. And then that September she died. So mm. I'm glad that we kind of mended before she yeah. passed away. Yeah. But I am kind of sad that I wasn't able to like show her who I was truly, yeah. but I don't think I actually had words mm -hmm. for who I was until, like, I met a trans person. And, like, I started... I knew I was trans when I started doing drag because I felt oh. more comfortable as a drag king than I ever had felt in my entire life. 
so cool. Yeah. And, like, I had gotten a glimpse of it growing up because I always got cast to play boy roles oh. when I did theater. And I always felt more comfortable being masculine on stage mm -hmm. and doing male roles. But I, once again, I didn't have the language for what it was. I didn't know who or what that meant. So when I started doing drag, I met a bunch of trans people and realized that like this was something that you could do. Yeah. So I'm kind of sad that she wasn't able to see me as I transitioned. I don't know. She was really religious, so I don't know how she would have handled it. I think at some point she just would have been like, you know what, you're my kid. Yeah. It is what it is. And that's kind of how my whole family is taking it. Yeah, I think that's pretty much how everyone's taking it. Yeah. I think I haven't had any super hard opposition in my family. Mm -hmm. But my family loves from a distance. So I am blessed in the fact that we don't have to interact very <laughs> often. Yeah. So yeah. they don't really care what's happening. Yeah, yeah. there's not the opportunity for big conflicts to arise. Yeah, like, I see them every once in a while, maybe every once every two or three years of that. And I mean, nowadays with, like, social media and texting and stuff, you can still be in contact with people without seeing them super often. Exactly. So, like, my family's on my Facebook. They mm -hmm. know how Aiden's doing. Yeah. They'll comment on his pictures or comment mm -hmm. on wedding pictures. So, like, mm -hmm. they know that I'm around and I'm yeah. doing okay. So there's no need to really be at home in Atlanta because I don't really see myself as an, an Atlanta person anymore. Even though you mentioned that it's sort of the center. It of... is. It is like the hub for LGBT mm -hmm. African Americans, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting. I always tell Hannah it's funny. Before Get Out, I didn't feel as uncomfortable around a bunch of white people, but then Get Out was like, uh. It kind of explained uh, for yeah, you. Yeah, I was like, about. now I'm like, I got a little bit of PTSD. Let me Gosh, just work yeah. through that. But it's interesting being around a bunch of African American LGBTQ individuals. It's like, huh. There's more of us yeah. around here. Like, um, the black trans conference of america is coming up and they do it in dallas but they also have done it in atlanta and it's been this amazing like i have a lot of trans black friends on facebook that yeah. i've never met in life oh, but yeah. we talk all the time seeing them at this conference was like wow there are so many of us yeah. whereas in louisville I literally feel like there's five of us yeah. some days or maybe 10 on a good day. Mm -hmm. um, in Kentucky, I'm like, there's 12 of us. There's only 12 <laughs> black trans people. Yeah. We need to get out of this state. Yeah. And it's one of those things where if there are more, there's a need to sort of be hidden. Yeah. Not to be as open about it. And therefore, it makes forming community more difficult. So difficult. I have, I have struggled often with thinking about going stealth yeah which has been an interesting like internal battle of like hmm do I go stealth and then I just for me it's not for me just because mm -hmm. I use my identity as advocacy a lot yeah. so yeah at work and I work with kids and there are a lot of trans kids that come in and out of our residential yeah. and being able to like have one-on-ones with them and be like, you know, it gets better. Like yeah. I am a trans man. You will, you will find your community. You will find your identity. Don't worry. Yeah. Um, and having my coworkers reach out to me and say, Hey, we have a trans kid coming in. I really want you to be able to sit down and have one-on-one -on -one with them because I want to make sure mm -hmm. I'm giving them the right services. That yeah. means something because yeah. that can change a kid's life. Absolutely. That's yeah. so powerful. Like you mentioned like when you grew up, you just you didn't even know trans was a thing. Mm -hmm. And I was the same way. I never heard of the concept of being mm -hmm. non-binary until college. Mm -hmm. So like you being able to be that for kids, to me it's... A, it sounds like a ministry type thing where like yeah. you really have this place where you're making a big difference. That's what I try to do. I think that even at home with our kid, we give him the language for everything in case he ever decides 
that he no longer wants to be binary or he wants to transition to a female or anything like that. We always give him the language because I've learned now that there's so many late transitioners because of the fact that they did not have that language growing up. Um, So my kid and my kid uses our teaching to teach his classmates. And sometimes he sometimes he interprets things a little bit wrong. Uh. Like I remember, <laughs> gosh, it was, what was it? It was about a year ago now. He was explaining trans to his friends and he was like, everyone's trans. Oh and I was God. like, Aiden, no, that's no. not how that works. He was like, and it's okay, mommy, you're a late bloomer, but you'll, you'll be a boy someday. Oh my and gosh. I was like, bub, that's... <laughs> Wait, let's go back, sit down, <laughs> come back. And he was like, No, everybody's trans, Dad. And That's I was so like, funny. No. That's like the opposite of, of yeah. what most of us are steeped in, where we assume that everyone is cis. Yes. Yeah, so, just like, Oh, so everyone's trans. Okay. Yeah. Like he yeah. took it and ran with it, and his classmates were like, Ah. Yeah. So we had to have a whole conversation yeah. about Aiden, not everyone is trans. <laughs> I appreciate that you think it's the coolest thing in the world, (laughs) but you don't have to be trans. And he's like, oh, so you choose it? And I'm like, kind of, of, (laughs) but no. Oh, poor little baby. So we... It's hard to explain. Yeah, it's hard to explain to him, but we give him that option of knowing that that language is out there. Yeah kind of run run with it and his imagination has gone really wild. It's so important to be able to imagine mm-hmm. different things for yourself and for the world. Exactly. So yeah, that's cool. He has a very, like, we are lucky and blessed in the fact that we have a very loving, kind kid. Yeah. So he is forever wanting to be the change of the world. He hates the way the world is right now and like we've taken him to marches and protests with us so he has that understanding of what the world looks like and he is very adamant in the fact that I want the world to be a better place. The world sucks right now and I'm like yeah but I wish I could tell you no but yeah. I I love that he is always about changing the future and being accepting and loving of everyone. He loves church. <laughs> I like I have never seen a kid love church so much, but yeah. every Sunday, whether it's our church or his mentor takes him to God, I'm gonna butcher this, but I think it's like it's E L I M, so Elim Baptist Church on the West End. Okay. Um, they just had had their 50th anniversary and they sung and ate them song in the choir and sang oh, all these like yeah. Negro spirituals. And he's been singing them all month. <laughs> and I kid you not, like in the middle of the night, I hear like Negro spirituals and I'm like, Aiden, <laughs> you are bringing back a whole lot of like mm. slave time things right now, kid. <laughs> And he's like, Daddy, I'm just singing to our ancestors. Calm mm. down. Because that's what they told the kids to like, yeah. sing loud. Sing to your ancestors. So he <laughs> he loves it, though. Like, he loves our church. He loves being a part of godly play. He loves mm. his friends in church. Mm. So we've, we've done good about giving him the foundation. Mm. Um, I always said, I'm never going to force him to go to church sure. or force him into any type of religion. So we've taken him to all types of churches oh, cool. um, just so he can see the foundation of what it looks like across the board. I don't want him to think that you have to be Christian. We've done a really good job of giving our kid a lot of options. That's really cool and so different from what most kids kind of grow up with, mm-hmm. where you go to one church and you kind of, you have to go. It's like a chore, mm-hmm. like you were saying before, for your childhood. So exactly. It's, it's really cool that you're showing him there's so many different ways to be religious or spiritual. Mm-hmm. And there's so many types of ways to worship. Yeah. And him being able to see that is really important yeah. to us. It's cool, like, though, that he has found connection mm-hmm. in two different churches. They're And they are two foundationally very different churches. So, mm-hmm. like... 
they are two Baptist churches, but Black Baptist and White Baptist looks very different. different. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate that he has been able to get so many different kinds of teachings. Yeah. And he loves them both, ironically. He loves them both equally, and he enjoys both of them equally. Yeah. He says that Highland's a little bit... He says, Daddy, our church is a little bit more strict than... Uh, <laughs> Carrie's church. Aunt Carrie's church, they just hoop and holler and they fall out. And I was like, <laughs> okay, bud. And he's like, I'm going to fall out at Highland. I was like, Aiden, don't fall they out. They might and not. Then, They'll be like, what they, is happening? They will call the ambulance. Yeah. Don't fall out in the aisle at our church. And he's like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to I guess do I can it. do that. It's almost like code switching. Like, yeah. Yeah. Wait, yeah. Wait, people, we... We stand very still. We don't like we the don't hymns, <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> "Let's break formal. out the drums." And I'm like, "Don't you dare! <laughs> that is not this kind of church, son." <laughs> so he's he's had his fair share of different yeah. churches, and he likes it. Yeah. So I'm I'm excited for him. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to watch his spirituality grow. Yeah, and him figure out everything for himself. Me and Hannah worked very hard to make sure that we give him the foundation, but we yeah. never force anything on him That's because true. she also grew up in a very forced religion mm -hmm. world. Like mm -hmm. she grew up across the bridge in New Albany and mm -hmm. there's a church over there called Graceland and it's a cult. I've heard of it. It's a cult. Mm -hmm. I said it. <laughs> you can take it out, but I said it. She had this like indoctored in her and, like, they taught those, like, harsh, divisive Christianity mentality things. So, like, homosexuality is wrong. Adultery yeah. is wrong. Divorce is wrong. All of these things. Mm -hmm. And so Hannah had a very hard time leaving that church yeah. and kind of figuring out religion for herself because it was so indoctrinated to her so yeah. we try very hard to do the opposite with Aiden. That's good it's like you mentioned before some of the trauma you had in high school around like conversion camp mm -hmm. while it sucks you went through it it allows you to like do better by your child. Exactly. And like you've been through this hard stuff and you know that there's there are better ways out there that mm -hmm. a child doesn't have to go through that. Exactly. What else do you want to talk about? Whether it's more about like faith stuff, your thoughts on like certain theology or the Bible. Or I don't know. My whatever. thoughts on, I have a hard time when it comes to theology just because it's so book heavy. Yeah. <laughs> like I am yeah. not a very good reader. So oh. I get lost in all the pages and I'm like, what did I just read? That's, yeah, that's what? like one of my goals, like one of sort of where I feel called is to make theology, especially like queer theology, trans theology, mm -hmm. and disability theology are, like, my two main passions. More accessible. Mm -hmm. to Like, it shouldn't be something where you have to read a million books and understand all this jargon. It's so, it's so hard to find foundational literature around queer theology. Yeah. It is. Oh gosh, because, yes. I, like, I've looked for, I, I think we have the majority of queer theology books mm -hmm. and even though sometimes are heavy yeah. I'm like yeah. I'm like what are they talking about and Hannah's like let me give you the background mm -hmm. and I'm like good because I don't know what's happening I even have the hardest time with like just our church in general when we talk about like god I'm gonna butcher this too CBF <laughs> Collaborative Baptist Fellowship like they're like the big Baptist mm, okay. people and like how our church m separated from the Southern oh, right. Baptist mm -hmm. Convention and mm -hmm. went to CBF and CBF is a little bit homophobic to you. And now oh. there's like a uproar at our church. And I'm like, God, it's a lot. It is. It's so I think I get lost with how much of church and organizations like churches function a lot like politics me too and it gets so obnoxious like hannah hannah laughs at me when we have to go to like what we call like our we have quarterly meetings mm -hmm. at church mm -hmm. and i'm like we're 
are we, what are we voting on? We're voting on votes to vote for the vote to vote. Like yes. what is happening? And like, there are times where like, I have literally been in meetings where we're voting on the committee mm -hmm. for the committee mm -hmm. to find the committee mm -hmm. to find a pastor. And I'm like, <laughs> what? It's so much. At what point do we have too many committees and yeah. too many votes? Yeah. And what is happening? And I guess for me, I that's where I struggle with church because it's like, who's on what committee has all yeah. the power, the deacons or the pastor or what is happening here? Mm -hmm. When did we just fundamentally become this political organization versus just a place to come to learn about God yeah. and to fellowship? Yeah, I think that where theology is for me, mm -hmm. I try to just find places to fellowship yeah. and find places of comfort. Mm -hmm. And I think when we take, so many churches forget what the church is for. Yeah. And I think Highland struggles with that too. Like mm -hmm. we did this whole Vision 2020 um, uh, like a year ago and it was our new revamp of our church. Mm -hmm. And they spent months upon months upon months surveying every Bible study, surveying all the congregations. And then we have all this information and we don't do anything with oh it. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you're you're so like, right. yeah. what, what was the point of doing this survey yeah. if we're just going to sit on it for yeah. a year or that's, two years or me, 20 years? That's the most frustrating thing is when churches will be like, all right, after years of researching we have determined that yes we do have a racism issue or a homophobia issue or whatever it is and then nothing happened <laughs> oh yeah highland has had a trans issue mm -hmm. for a long time yeah and they're um, like yeah we know it and that's the end of the conversation they're like we're working on it trans yeah. women national meets here and i'm like which is okay cool. yeah. that's cool mm -hmm. but then what? <laughs> what else? Yeah. Like, I have foundationally been trying to get Highlands to change their bathroom forever. Oh and gosh. it's never going to happen. That's me because, at the seminary. And like, it's, it's so frustrating. And they're like, but there's a family bathroom. And I'm like, I don't want to go to a family yeah. bathroom that's a, like, where that's people like... go to change their child. <laughs> it's That's creepy to you. Yeah, like, <sighs> the bathroom issue just drives me up a wall because it is the most basic simple way to be Just a decent stop, human change being. Change the sign. Yeah. That is all you have to it do. It is the tiniest thing. And yet it takes forever to get it to happen. That's mm -hmm. where this seminary is at right now. Mm -hmm. It took like a whole year to get a proposal passed by the council. Then our president who he retired like this past summer, mm -hmm. he vetoed it as one of his last acts as our school president. Yes. And then we've been trying to get it like kind of, like this fall, we got the president, the new president to sort of be like, oh, yeah, you can do the thing that the council approved. But the signs that they've put out, I'm not, they're, they're, they're not what we wanted. They're, they are not the signs we did the proposal for. Mm -hmm. They're just on single stall bathrooms to have a gender neutral sign. And they have like that stick figure that's like half, half. a dress oh. and half like not a dress. And I'm just like, this is not what we were asking for. We like, I wrote this like, 10 page proposal with photos of different signs they might consider using. Mm -hmm. And like, we also wanted stuff done with the gendered bathrooms to mm -hmm. like, but yeah. And it's just, it is it's frustrating that it takes forever. And it is one of the basic cheapest things you can do yes. as an organization yes. to affirm so many people. Yeah. Um, and it's, and the, it's the first thing people see when you, when you walk in, like, mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but like as a trans person, that's what I'm looking in whenever oh, I enter yeah. a new public space. So it's bathroom. interesting. I spoke at um, Holland. I went to Holland, Michigan mm -hmm. and spoke at her church and talking about um, being a black man mm -hmm. and a black trans man and how to be more affirming of black trans individuals. 
And it was the first church I had ever been to that had gender neutral bathrooms. Mm -hmm. And the gendered bathrooms were all the way in the back. So they made it where they were like, if you want the gendered bathrooms, you have to go out of way. Mm -hmm. And like the bathrooms up front were all gender neutral. And I remember being like asking them how much did that cost? And they were like, it literally cost us maybe 400 bucks to get new signs. That's nothing. Wow. And I was like, my church frustrates me now because this is the most simple, Mm -hmm. easy change. Well, especially Mm -hmm. at a place like Highland Baptist Mm -hmm. where it's full of like progressive liberals, mostly white who are like those kinds that are like, we're good, like we're good allies. Something people will be like, okay, cool. So you said it's bad, but I don't know what to do. Do you have sort of concrete like examples of what signage is good for bathrooms and churches, like what they should do? I literally verbatim just like having bathroom, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like <laughs> on the just, sign, just bathroom. Yeah, like I don't porta potties just say bathroom. Like yeah. I'm just <laughs> yeah, saying, under- <laughs> like I just don't understand why. Yeah. I think people sometimes make it more difficult than it has to be. Yeah. So, like, just saying bathroom or, like, I appreciate Joe's ability to preach without using gendered language. Oh, nice. Um, And Lauren does a good job of that as well, of making sure that we're not calling the Father or the Son the Holy Spirit. Like, there's alternative language. Yeah. And there's also inclusive language. Mm -hmm. So, I think that we need to be aware of that and... There are whole podcasts and books about how to be inclusive in the way that you preach. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's important for churches, and I think that's simple, easy changes. Highlands Forever, like, Derek, what is it going to take for (laughs) trans people to feel comfortable here? Literally, those two things are the most basic basic accepting things. Yeah. And And also not doing weird, awkward things like, you're visiting and you're trans? Here's Derek. He's trans. (laughs) No, that's weird. Don't do things like that. That's so awkward. Do y'all know each other? No. Do all (laughs) black people know each other? No. The white people might be like, do you? (laughs) Exactly. They're like, well, do you? (laughs) No. What is wrong with you? Like, I... I think I'm so open about my transness because mm. I wear like I wear my blackness. Mm. So don't be awkward about me being black. Don't be awkward about me being trans. Yeah. It is Yeah, s- just be chill. Just, Everyone just be just chill. Everybody chill out. Uh-huh. It is not that complicated. Yeah. But people make it far more complicated yeah. than it has to be. That's true. A lot of it is just like simple like habit changes. Like mm-hmm. you like it like might take you a little bit. Like as a preacher, you might kinda catch yourself and like in your sermon draft or whatever like fix stuff up but Mm -hmm. like if you do it for a month you're gonna get so used to it that it becomes second nature and same with like ushers and stuff like Mm -hmm. whoever your greeters are in your church instead of like when people walk in being like hey ladies just be like hey friend you know hey exactly instead of immediately gendering people as they walk in the door because that for me is the other thing if I walk in a church and I'm immediately getting called like ma'am and stuff I'm just like Oh, you mean so well, but you're doing so bad. Like, mm-hmm. Or even I, for a while there, we were trying to get our ushers to have their pronouns mm-hmm. on their badge. I like that. And introducing themselves with pronouns. Mm-hmm. And Highland had the hardest time figuring out how to do that. And I was like, you figure out how to say your name. All you have to do is, hi, my name is Derek. I use he, him pronouns. Really how awesome. about you? Yeah. That is... Yeah. The easiest way to introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah. But it's so mind blowing to people. Yeah. And that's such a, that's another one. Just get in the habit of it. It might feel kind of weird at first. You might forget mm-hmm. a few times, but if you do it a month, you'll get there. Exactly. Yeah. It's not rocket science <laughs> to be an inclusive church. Yeah. It just means making yourself more uncomfortable. Yeah. To make, the minority comfortable. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. I just, I don't know how 
to like there's no way for me to make people get that there's no way for people to feel like it's a priority for that um which is struggling yeah. um but it's it's very simple mm-hmm. it's so simple it's the basic of things they're like we have a ladies group we have a men's group <laughs> why do we have gendered groups y'all yeah. what are we talking about in those gendered groups mm-hmm. that make it mm-hmm. where we wouldn't want the other sex there yeah. or non-binary <laughs> people there yeah. Yeah. what weird stuff is happening behind yeah, this closed what is going on in yeah that? like i'm like yeah and I know that we have included whatever gender identity you identify as. Mm-hmm. You can go to whatever group you want. Which is a nice addition. You it's know. a nice addition. But what about people who don't identify yeah. in your gendered box? Yeah. Like. Just don't go to any group. It's they fine. don't get to go to group. Or I'll just have a little non-binary group by myself. Whatever. Yeah. And they're like, well, <laughs> we can have a non-binary group. And I was like, oh, so you want to put them by themselves? Can we have a black people group too? <laughs> No, that sounds weird. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> it sounds pretty weird. Yeah. Like. Yeah. yeah. And it, like every now and then I think there is a good reason for gendered groups. Mm-hmm. For instance, if the men's group is talking about toxic masculinity, by mm-hmm. all means make it a men's group because women probably don't want to go to that anyway. Like you guys work through your sexist stuff by yourself. That's totally cool. But if you're just talking about, like, the Bible, why is it got to be only men, like a men's club in there? Exactly. Yeah. Why do we all have to read just like Jesus and all have gendered groups about it? It yeah. don't make no sense. Yeah. Especially because the more diverse your group is, whatever that diversity is, like age or gender or race, anything, mm-hmm. the more voices you have contributing to, like, exactly. here's what I think the Bible's saying the more everyone's mind is going to be opened. So Mm -hmm. it's not just a matter of being like more inclusive of trans people, which should be enough by itself. But in case it's not, it'll also help the cis people in the room. Mm -hmm. And I have felt probably the most uncomfortable at the men's group Mm. because it is so much toxic masculinity, (laughs) cisgender ridiculousness i'm like i don't care if i identify as male or not i don't even want to come to your (laughs) group this is not relatable (laughs) this is not relatable and really awkward i'm good i'll let you go soon i'm sorry marie said this is ridiculous okay (laughs) marie says like just let the people go in the groups they want and let me out of the bathroom (laughs) (laughs) i think i struggle the most with highland because highland prioritizes everything else but trans issues like I struggle with churches a lot with that because of the fact that they either lump us with the LGB individuals and or they they do something for LGB they're doing stuff for Mm -hmm. us and they're not or they just forget about us in general and I'm like Highland you have to do better churches in general just have to do better because Mm -hmm. although we are not the majority, though there's so few of us that are minority. It's like, it feels like almost like dealing with extinction, like, yeah. like yeah. polar bears or something. Yeah. I'm like, if you keep <laughs> forgetting us and we keep dying yes. or killing ourselves, mm-hmm. then there's not going to be any more of us. And then mm-hmm. you're going to look up and be like, well, what happened? Yeah. And it was because you weren't affirming of those minorities that you had there or who were coming through because you're like, oh, well, that's not a priority issue for us. There's hardly any of them. Yeah, there's hardly any of them. So why would we change our bathrooms for four or five people when the vast majority of the other 1,200 people (laughs) at Highland Mm -hmm. are going to the gendered bathrooms mm-hmm. as they are, why would we change our bathroom for those four or five individuals? Yeah. And I get so frustrated with things like that because I always break, I think I'm lucky in the fact that I can bring things back to simplicity when it comes to talking to my church. Mm-hmm. So whereas they'll be like, well, we have the family neutral bathroom. I was like, oh, is that also the black bathroom too? Oh. And they're like, no, you can use whatever bathroom you want. Mm -hmm. And I was like, but do you see how that fundamentally sounds? Yeah. So when you say, 
oh, well, they have their own bathroom. Yeah, mm-hmm. black people have their own bathrooms, too. Yeah. It didn't work well. Yeah. Separate but equal is not a thing. Yeah. Um, so you may only be changing it for the minority amount of people. Mm-hmm. But if that's the case, then just bring back your colored bathrooms because there's only three of us here. So, oh, yeah. No, that makes you uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable as well. So I think that... Highlighting for them the similarities. Yeah. And this discrimination, this sort of push, literally marginalization, like Mm -hmm. pushing people to the side. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, yeah, the I'm so with you with like churches being like, well, we don't have any trans people or we have like one or two trans people. So that's not going to be something we care about too hard. You're never going to have more than one or two trans people until you have a space where trans people who visit can be like, okay, this is a place that truly welcomes Mm -hmm. me. They're going to just keep walking away. They're going to keep feeling pushed out. Yeah, I definitely 100% agree. I think that I struggle with our church because our church fundamentally will, you guys will go overseas to Africa to build houses and give out shoes and food, Mm -hmm. but you can't change your bathroom for the people that you have here who (laughs) are struggling. Like you want to become a refugee church right now Mm -hmm. and bring in immigrants and be this safe haven, but you can't be a safe haven for trans people. Like I struggle so hard with it Mm -hmm. and it's not just my church. There's, thousands of churches that have the same battle every single day Mm -hmm. and I think it only becomes apparent to my church and most of those churches when it's like trans visibility day or trans trans day of remembrance remembrance. like that's remembering to grieve for those of us who have died Mm -hmm. because our society is so hostile to us and like ironically not this year, this past year, because it was at Douglas mm-hmm. this past year, but the year before, the first Trans Day of Remembrance service was at Highland. Yeah. I was like, so you that. brought a bunch of trans people in this place yeah. without a bathroom for them. Yeah. Do you understand yeah. how absolutely ridiculous that sounds? That's yeah. messed up. Um, so, like, I just, gosh... Or during Pride Week, Mm -hmm. the Pride service Mm -hmm. is at Highland. Mm. It makes no sense to me. It's (laughs) baffling to me. But it also reiterates to me that often the LGB community forgets the T community as well. And they marginalize us as well and they don't pay attention to us. And they do things that are really harmful to us and they don't really care because they're like... Well, the majority of us are happy and living our lives, yeah. so why would we be concerned? Mm-hmm. Like, I I was Mr. KPF 2017-18. KPF? Sorry. Oh, Kentucky Anna Pride Foundation. Okay. just So they are the people who do our large pride. Okay. Um, and they have long long had a race issue and a trans issue Mm -hmm. and that's how Louisville Pride started Mm -hmm. because the large funders for KPF Mm -hmm. figured that they had a race issue and separated and that's why Ford no longer um Ford no longer puts money in KPF. They put money in Louisville Pride. Okay. Um, and they sponsor Louisville Pride. And Louisville Pride's, their entire board members mm-hmm. are all people of color. That Whereas KPF has one biracial, Asian, and black individual. He is the only person of color that has ever been on their board. Yeah. So anyway, you were the reigning KPF. And I stepped down because Mm -hmm. when I did the pageant, I refused to wear the rainbow because Mm -hmm. I didn't find that to be um, pride for me. I wore the trans flag and um, a lot of people had an issue with that. A lot of people were like, where's your rainbow? You have to wear a rainbow. It's pride. And I was like, pride is whatever you want it to be. It does not have to be this rainbow. 
and that rainbow is drenched in black trans women's blood. Mm -hmm. So no, I'm good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Then I thought the board was fine. All of a sudden, during my reign, mm -hmm. they had the audacity to change their rules for the first time ever mm -hmm. and say that the rainbow flag had to be the majority represented wow. when doing your pride wear. And they just and, happened to do that while you were... And they were like, it had nothing to do with you. Oh, and I was like, not. oh, because I didn't forcefully break this rule last year because you didn't have a rule. So I interpreted it with, yeah. I interpreted it the way I wanted to interpret mm -hmm. it, which is fair game. Yes. Pride is however yeah. you envision pride. Yeah. A pride flag doesn't have to be the rainbow flag. It can be the trans flag. It could be the asexual yeah. flag. It could be Bisexual, any, of those. any yeah. flag you want it to be as long as it is your identity. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so they literally pushed you out. So I struggle so much with that and how then you look at all these people who end up going to churches mm -hmm. and they kind of have the same mentality at church. Mm -hmm. Like, it almost feels like people only care about trans people when we're dying, oh, not when shoot. we're trying to live. Mm -hmm. Like, and I always struggle with that because I'm like, you guys only care when we're dead. Like, yeah. that is the only time you ever want to grieve for us mm -hmm. or pay attention to us mm -hmm. or pay attention to the things that we struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. or make things accepting and equal for us if you're gonna be sad when we die you got to keep us from dying yeah because we are a small group we can't do it by ourselves exactly so i think that especially in louisville i've seen that there are huge amount of lgb allies who don't know how to be allies who don't know what that means yeah. and who don't know how to advocate for people who are trans mm -hmm. and who are non-binary and who are the minority of the minority of the minority. Yeah. So instead of advocating for us, they just ignore us. Yeah. And that's frustrating, especially mm -hmm. in the church world where it's supposed to be come one, come all, yeah. you know? And there's this, there's this idea in scripture, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, that God sort of pays the most attention to the people that the world is pushing out. Mm -hmm. The marginalized and oppressed are the ones that God listens to when they cry out. But that's not who the church pays attention to. Exactly. And oh, my previous pastor once told me, like, while we, <laughs> first off, me and Joe, Joe Phelps, he used to mm -hmm. be the pastor of Highland. Mm -hmm. Me and Joe had to have mediation. Like, we had mm -hmm. to have a therapist in the room to talk with us wow. because our conversations had gotten so hostile. At one point, he was like, Derek, you can't be so forceful to get people to change. And I was like, Joe, we are dying. Yeah. Like, we are dying. And it's not like they listen to us when we're nice. Yeah. And I was like... I've tried that. <laughs> oh, trust me. I'm, I'm sure I've you have, I've been the too. most accommodating person. It's, like, especially when you bring race into it for you. Like, when I, as a white person, am a little forceful, it's not seen. And I'm sure, like, for you, it's even worse. Oh, Highland thinks I'm the most aggressive, yeah. angry black man. Yeah. And I think it's hilarious because <laughs> I am the opposite of... Like, you're this Agre entire conversation. You've been so calm. Like I'm just, I'm not you're a aggressive, nice person. You're, yeah. <laughs> but I am forceful with my beliefs you and I am forceful be, yes. about equality. And Joe has a mentality of we have to walk people along with us. And I was like, if people aren't walking, you need to leave them behind. Yeah. There's a point. Like, by yeah. all means, if people are willing to walk along, mm -hmm. we can be gentle with them. We will be, you know, patient with them. But if they're not willing to walk along, we're going to have to get forceful and try and get them to move along. Highland give gives people decades, like yeah. a little bit about Highland. Highland was the first church in Kentucky, Baptist church, to do a gay marriage. Okay. And it was two of my friends, well, okay. two of my acquaintances, uh -huh. and they... Dis the deacons in the church ministry mm -hmm. discussed this for five years before they got married. 
Mm -hmm. five years. They discuss whether their marriage was worth it, whether it would last, all of, like, the two white gay men, they discussed them as individuals, these people, if they were committed into church, if they were tithing, all of these things. Things that a straight couple would not get asked. Yeah. Yeah. And it took them five years to finally agree to marry them. That, oh, I guess they are good Christians who deserve mm -hmm. marriage. Like So when I started fighting the church because the church, mm -hmm. the tradition is that only someone on staff can baptize you. Mm -hmm. I'm from a black Baptist church where anybody can baptize yeah. mm -hmm. and I wanted Bojangles to baptize me as because it meant something very special for me as my authentic self to be baptized. I've been baptized before, but not as my yeah. like not as my authentic self. Mm -hmm. um, and the deacons discussed it and there was all types of fights. And I straight up told Highland, I'm not waiting five years for you to figure <laughs> this out. I'm not. Mm -hmm. They had all kind of accommodations. They were like, well, what if Joe does it, but Bojangles is also in the water with you? Mm -hmm. What if Bojangles holds your hand while you're getting baptized? What if he's the one who says the prayer? Mm -hmm. I was like, you guys ordained him as a pastor. Wow, yeah. And you won't let him do my baptism. Do you know wow. how ridiculous you're sounding? So he, he's ordained as a pastor Yet and by still By this wouldn't. church. By Joe. Joe ordained him. That's why. That's it just, is not the most mind blowing thing. That yeah, and that's just one of those cases where like I'm I'm taking a class right now on Presbyterian polity, so like mm -hmm. all the like government stuff mm -hmm. of, and like I'm it confuses me, it baffles me, it frustrates me. But I get to an extent you need some order. Mm -hmm. You need rule like it's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But when it's getting in the way of people connecting with God mm -hmm. and connecting with each other the way you wanted to do with your baptism, we're putting these rules over that worship and connection, and that's a problem. And it like it's a big problem. One, I never got baptized. Two, oh, so it never worked out. It like okay. they're still to this day discussing this damn issue. Okay. So it might and take five years for you. It may, and yeah. then two. It now makes me not even want to be baptized at Highland. Because when just, they finally agree, if they finally agree, it's just going to feel like... It's going to feel like, oh, now I'm worthy of being baptized by yeah. Bojangles in your church. Like, I'd rather go outside with a water bottle. Like, <laughs> I just... Yeah. I don't want this full show. And it made me feel very... It made me feel very rejected yeah. by the church. Rejected for one, wanting someone with the closest identity to mine, mm -hmm. who I had the most connection with, yeah. to baptize me mm -hmm. because that's where it was. Like, yeah. I felt a connection with Bojangles. Bojangles is someone that I adamantly adore. I think that he is an amazing person. Mm -hmm. I think that he is an amazing Christian mm -hmm. and he has done a lot of work to get Highland to where it is. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it's fair that Highland sometimes treats Bojangles like the gay uncle. Mm -hmm. So though, like yeah. he can, he even preaches Friday night churches. Uh -huh. So you won't put him on staff and pay him. Mm -hmm. He can't baptize me. Mm -hmm. But you ordained him, and when you ever need anything LGBT oriented, then he is more than willing to do it. Mm -hmm. So it felt very demeaning of not only myself, but of him and his place in the church and my place in the church. It really made me very frustrated mm -hmm. to the point where that's when I did stop going to church. and. Mm -hmm just started going to Bible study because I don't feel like I'm a part of my church. I feel like I'm like mm -hmm. a visitor every Sunday yeah. versus I've joined this church and I don't have a place in this church. Yeah. I'm so sorry that that happened to you. Mm. Another example of getting pushed out. Yeah. yeah. And it's one of those things where I, I think that's why I work through mm -hmm. church mm -hmm. 
because I have a lot of harsh feelings about church and then it keeps getting reaffirmed when things like that happen. So I think that, but I, I feel like I would do myself a disservice if I just up and left the church. Yeah. Um, because I do find solace and comfort Mm -hmm. in a higher power and I have made a community where I can in my church. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk more about that sort of, because for me, that's always one of the big questions. Why do we stay? You know, so. I have made a community in my Bible studies. I love my Bible study groups. They are amazing individuals, especially my 11 o'clock group. We're called Progressive Parenting. And one, I found solace in other parents. Yeah. Cause me and Hannah struggle because we are in this weird we're in this weird age group. Like Hannah's twenty five, I'm twenty seven, and we have a six year old. Mm-hmm. So all the other people with six year olds are like thirty five. Yeah. And they're all buying houses and we're yeah. like, mm, are you now? Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. I'm gonna go pay my rent now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um mm-hmm. so it's it's fun being a part of this world, but we dissect everything in our Bible study group. We that dissect politics a lot. Mm-hmm. We dissect identity a lot. We dissect sexual orientation. Mm-hmm. We dissect how to talk to our kids about sex, like mm-hmm. just everything, just because we have such a close knit community. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Mm-hmm. So I love that we have found our own community. And I yeah. think that's why I keep staying. I stay because. I found community, and I say because Aiden's found community yeah. more than anything. Yeah. As a parent, I would sacrifice anything for him. Yeah. So if that means, like right now, he goes to low elementary. It is one of the widest schools, but, like, <laughs> he has a great education there. Mm-hmm. So, like, if I have to sacrifice being uncomfortable mm. and wear this paisley purple and pink monogram shirt for PTA, (laughs) then I'm going to wear this paisley pink and purple monogram shirt for PTA because (laughs) my son has a great education. Yeah. And that's kind of where church is. He has a great foundation there, and I don't Mm -hmm. ever want to disrupt that. Yeah. I would feel like we weren't being our best parents if we didn't give him the foundation of something. Yeah. That's why we give him a foundation of a little bit of everything, just so he can figure it out himself. Yeah, that's really cool. So it seems like we're getting ready to wrap up. Mm -hmm. My, I'd like to ask people as sort of a last question, if you have one last sort of piece of of advice for trans and non-binary people, um, like of faith or just in general. Of faith? Mm -hmm. Find your people. Mm-hmm. They're out there. Mm-hmm. There is there is room for you to be your true authentic self and still have your faith. And there are people out there who will affirm that and who will support that mm-hmm. um, and advocate for that and advocate for you. Um, you just have to find them and hold on to you can find them. Um That's pretty much my advice just in general for trans people. Um, I know it's hard. It's tough. It's rough. There are days where the most trans of trans people are like, did I make a mistake? Did I? Mm -hmm. Maybe life was easier the other way. Maybe I could just go back into whatever box I was put in in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that there is so much strength and so much bravery and living your true authentic self because Mm -hmm. some people live their whole life and never have that yeah yeah well thank you so much for coming and being on here today no problem thank you for having me i appreciated it so many thanks to derek for sitting down with me and sharing some of his story and so many thanks to all of you listeners who took time out of your day to hear his story. Next episode should be up in two weeks. And in the meantime, go break some binaries and bless the world with your life.